If you love the Lord, say amen. Jeff, it can happen to any one of us. I guarantee you, brother. I want to talk today about the subject of the will of God. How do we know what the will of God is? We talk about it as we should. We pray about it and we should. We follow the example of Jesus when he said, not my will, but your will be done as he prayed in the garden. And we should follow that example. He is our perfect example in all things. We follow the teaching of the book of James, where James by inspiration says, you, sh you shouldn't say that you're going to go into a city on a certain day and in the future, and you're going to buy and sell and trade and make money. But instead, you should say, not that I am sure that I'm going to go, but if it is the Lord's will, I will do this or that. But how do we know what the will of the Lord is? Sometimes it is not clear. That is very true, that it is not clear. It is not clearly stated in God's word in every instance, what is our will? What is his will for our lives, I should say? But in many instances, it is very clear, abundantly clear, because God states or his son states or the Holy Spirit states through an inspired writer specifically clearly what the will of God is. Those are the passages, some of them, that we're going to look at today. Not where you have to use your judgment, not where you have to use inference, not where you have to use uh, example of the apostles or the uh, early church, not where you have to look at principles, but specific verses where the word of God says that either Jesus said directly or the Holy Spirit says directly or the Father himself says directly what the will of God is. First of all, almost picking up exactly where we left off last week, we need to start with the example of Jesus. Last week we talked about following in his footsteps and walking after him and imitating him in everything, and that's where we're going to start today because if we're to know what the will of God is, what we need to know is what Jesus said about the will of God. And in fact, what Jesus did to show us what the will of God is because he's our perfect example. Look in John chapter 4. We didn't read these verses last week, so it's fitting that we read them this week. They were on the last slide, on the, almost the very last bullet last week. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus says, I came to do the will of him who sent me. That is his nourishment. That is his sustenance. My, my food means that's what I live by doing. Man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God, he says in another instance. Look in chapter 5 and verse number 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So clearly, Jesus taught in his earthly ministry to his opponents, to the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, who were looking for everything he could possibly say that they could catch on and, and find an accusation to make against him. He said, I'm not here doing my own thing, making up my own way, teaching my own doctrine. Instead, I'm doing exactly what the Father sent me to do, and I'm doing exactly what his word is, or teaching exactly what his word is, which is what he says in the very next chapter. John chapter 6 beginning at verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should not lose anything, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son of Man, who sees the Son and believes in him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Clearly, Jesus is saying, the will of my Father so that we can know clearly what it is, so the apostles could know clearly what it was, was that nobody who came to him, that would include, include those that were listening to him speak these words in the first century, Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, and Bartholomew, and Thaddeus, and all of the others, he let them know that it was the Father's will that none of them should be lost. None of them should go astray. None of them should fall. That was, the God, that was God's desire. That was the son's desire. But someone might say, then God's will was not done. In a very real sense, that is true. Because we know God gives us free will. He, when we become his servants and 
seek to serve him for the rest of our lives. And when we become disciples of Christ and seek to follow after him, God does not make us keep his will. So we could choose at times to go in another direction other than what God has told us to do. We could choose to do things that are not, that are clearly not the Lord's will, and we know they're not the Lord's will, but we have free will to do what we will, not to do what the Father wills, and not to do what the Spirit wills, and not to do what the Son wills. And so it is that Judas chose not to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father was that all 12 that came to Jesus would not depart, but Judas chose to depart. His love of money, his covetousness, his desire for things other than the things of God caused him to, while doing the job of being a keeper of the money of the disciples and of Jesus' uh, purse, so to speak, he took money from that bag that the women and other disciples put in for the ministry of Jesus. And then he betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And the scripture says he was a lover of money. It says that he did those things because he wanted the silver and the gold and the copper that was in that bag. So he chose not to do God's will. The lesson to us clearly is that we can depart from God's will, but we must choose not to become like Judas, not to do what Judas did, not to resist the will of God. All of us at some time, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that we have in one way or another resisted the will of God. Sometimes even worse, we have outright rebelled against the will of God, not just not wanting to do it. That's common, unfortunately, amongst servants of God at times in their lives, Jonah the prophet being a great example of rebellion and resisting the will of God. Peter resisted the will of God, but he repented and came back. Judas rebelled, completely turned against what God's will was, and he did not come back. He did not repent. So Judas is called in the scriptures the son of perdition. Jesus calls him that. And that means he was lost or he was one that was completely rebellious to God. He was one that turned his back on God. A great example for us of what not to do, to instead repent as Peter did, weeping with tears bitterly after he denied the Lord but not betrayed the Lord as Judas did. But the Father's will was that none of them should be lost. And the Father's will, by the way, is the same for us today. And that is not to say, once saved, we will always be saved. We can do exactly what Judas did. We must not do what he did. And then we will fulfill the Father's will and not depart from Jesus' hand. Look at John chapter 7, verse 16 and 17. John chapter 7, verse 16 and 17. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether it, I speak of my own authority. Similarly, similarly today, we can know whether the things the scriptures teach are of God. If we will to do the will of God, if we desire to do the will of God, God gives us discernment and wisdom, and we can pray for that. You see, it is God's will that we as his followers, we as his servants and followers of Jesus Christ, choose willingly to obey his will, to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and therefore to do his will. That is God's will, that we be discerning, knowledgeable servants that choose volitionally, freely to do his will. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 31 and following. Because not only are we told by the words of Jesus that we just looked at, that it is the Father's will that we choose to do his will, and it would please the Father that we do so, look at what Jesus says is a blessing, promise to every single one of us that do the will of the Father, beginning at verse 31 of Mark chapter 3. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them and said, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. What a great pronouncement of blessing on those that were sitting there that day. But it's the same for us today. 
If we choose to be like those that sat literally at Jesus' feet, though we can't sit literally at Jesus' feet today, if we choose to spiritually stay with the Master and listen to His words and listen to His teaching and follow them and be His imitators and His followers as they were doing that day physically and spiritually, if we do so spiritually today, look at the promise that is uh, given to us. Look at the promise that Jesus makes to us when He says... If you will do this as they did, you will be to me like my mother or my brothers. That is, my siblings, that, those that I love the most on this planet, those that I'm closest to, those that are my closest family associations. Jesus said we can have that kind of relationship with him if we choose to seek his will as they were seeking in that day and follow it closely as they were attempting to and successfully that day following after his will so that he looked at them and said, here are my mother and my brethren, those that do the will of God. So what is the will of God? The will of God clearly stated in his word is that we be holy. The word is from the Greek, the word holiness is from the Greek word hagios, and it means literally set apart. And in the context, you can tell it means set apart from this world, set apart from sin, and at the same time separated from those things and separated and set, it, set apart to God. It means that we have chosen willfully, volitionally of our own free will to turn our back on the things of the world, thus the things of Satan, and instead turn and live for spiritual things, live for God, to make heaven our home, to repent of past deeds. As I said last week, it matters not what you did in the past. Are you now walking in the light? Are you now walking in Jesus' footsteps? Are you now imitating him is the question. It is God's will stated in his scripture in multiple places clearly that we be holy as his followers, as his servants. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, one of the best passages that clearly states this will, this will for God, uh, for us, that it is God's will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. In this particular passage of scripture, the writer Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, states very plainly, very clearly what God's will is. And that's the kind of passages that we're talking about in this lesson today, beginning at verse number three of chapter four. For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? Your sanctification. Now, maybe we don't use that terminology, that term much amongst us today. But I would suggest to you that if the scripture says and that's what we're supposed to be, then we should call each other that, sanctified. We are the sanctified ones. If you today have been born again, let's use some other terms that mean the same thing. If you today have been born again, then you are sanctified. Because one that is born again has been remade by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the grace of God and his mercy. No longer are you a sinner as you once were. You've been reborn. Born again means set apart to God, separated from sin, dedicated to God. That is sanctified. That is sanctification. If you are one that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you are sanctified. They mean the same thing. If you've been baptized for unto, according to the Greek, unto or for the remission of sins, then you are washed, cleansed, purified. And those three phrases mean sanctification. You've been cleansed, you've been made whole, whole and holy, and you are sanctified. And so the will of God is your sanctification. It is not a one-time thing, though, one-time event. It is an ongoing thing. Look at the next phrase. That you should abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testify, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has given us his Holy Spirit. So as we look at what the will of God is, there are clear statements such as this. Couldn't be any clearer to us. 
that the will of God is for me, you, all children of God, to be sexually pure. That means before marriage, remain celibate. That means once you're married, one man, one woman for life. That means if you're unmarried, then you have to remain again celibate. Sexual impurity, the word there is the word pornea in the Greek. And it sounds a lot like the word that we get the word pornography from. And therefore, no practice related to pornography can be allowed or even mentioned amongst those that are the children of God. We must be separated and apart from all things that are sexually impure and unclean. And therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Pursue holiness without which no one will see God. Imagine that. Striving to live now to serve God. But in the last day, hear the words, depart from me, you that worked iniquity, because I do not know you. And the reason that that is said to us is because I did not pursue holiness, because the scripture warns, without which I cannot see God. Hebrews 13, 4, interestingly, in the next very next chapter, says fornication and adulterers, God will judge. Sexual purity is against the world's standards. We know that. It was in the Roman society. As bad as our society is, Greek and Roman society was perhaps even worse. Ours is getting there. But Satan's desire is to take that which is pure and holy, the desire we have sexually, and to pervert it and to twist it and to totally tamper with it in such a way that you and I fall into sin so that we're not sexually pure. And God's word tells us in no uncertain terms that if we're going to see him, if we're going to live with him in eternity, in other words, we must be sexually pure, repent of fornication and adultery, and serve the living God with our bodies at all times. Romans chapter 12 is a passage we're very familiar with. It says the same thing. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 tells us, that we're not to be like this world, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove that which is that perfect will of God. The word prove there is translated in other, some other translations different ways. Test and approve what is the perfect will of God. It means that, literally. Prove the will of God or test and approve. Don't be like the world in my thinking. Be changed and transformed. The word is metamorphosized. Once a caterpillar, now a butterfly is the idea. Once in the cesspool of the world, perhaps, now clean and pure in all ways to prove, to test and approve what the perfect will of God is in my life. Here's a good passage that tells us what it means to test and approve what the perfect will of God is, the idea of holiness and sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, the apostle Peter says by inspiration, for this is the will of God. Not implied, stated very clearly, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Well, we started in the middle of the paragraph, in the middle of the thought. This is the will of God. What is, Peter? What is the will of God? Look back in verse 13. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake invariably means so that it pleases the Lord, so that the Lord's name is glorified, so that his name is not cursed among men, so that his name is not made fun of. The kingdom of God is not belittled. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as the ultimate supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by the king for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? That servants of God, disciples of Christ, members of the family of God, submit to the ordinances, the laws, the statutes of the governing authorities that we are under at that time. Now to think about it, as we have mentioned it in other times, think of the implication of this. Christ did not say submit to the ordinance of men in a just and fair and godly theocratic society. Instead, he says, submit to the ordinances of the ruling authorities, 
Who was the ruling authority when Peter said this? When the Holy Spirit gave Peter these words and Peter wrote these words, who was the ruling authority? The ruling authority was Caesar. The ruling authority was Pilate. The ruling authority was Herod. Three of the worst sinful leaders that possibly could have ever lived up until that time and maybe in all time were the ruling authorities. They were the ones making and enforcing the ordinances. And Jesus, whether Peter by inspiration said, follow the governing authority. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7, where we won't take time to turn right now, Paul says the same thing by inspiration. Follow the governing authority, pay taxes to whom taxes are due, give honor to whom honor is due, fear to whom fear is due. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, where we are right now, say exactly the same thing that we as Christians are to submit to the governing authority. It does not matter if the governing authority is a dictator. It does not matter if the governing authority is a non-believer or an idol worshiper as they were at this time. The governing authority is put there by God according to Romans chapter 13. Honor the king, even if it's Caesar, even if he's dictator, even if he's a despotic dictatorial ruler, cruel and despotic in every way, even if he's a sinful ruler, authority is from God and appointed by God. Honor the king. Remember Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, by other name? They submitted to the authority of God. They give us a great example. Jesus submitted to the authority of man, rather the ordinance of men, and we as well must because it clearly says this is the will of God. Why? That you can put to silence the ignorance of foolish men so that nobody in the world around us could point and say, yeah, those are those Christians who won't obey the commandments of God. Instead, they should be able to look at the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, every local congregation of God's people and say, those people submit to the ruling authorities. Those people obey the law of God and the law of Christ by obeying the law of man. So we live, in other words, long way to say, we live to reflect the gospel. We live to put the gospel in good light. We live so that the kingdom of God is glorified here on earth. We live so that God's name is not ridiculed and mocked. Instead, we bring glory to God by the lifestyle that we live following the will of God, including in this particular thing. Look back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Now another promise comes at the conclusion of these ideas of uh, commandments or statements of what we're supposed to do to be holy, just like we did before, we have now a passage of Scripture that tells us that we get the blessing by doing the will of God. Look at 5.16 of 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I'm going to take the last statement first. This is the will of God. What is the will of God? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Put it all together, and you can conclude that doing the will of God brings joy, causes you to rejoice. Doing the will of God in the life of a child of God causes you to be thankful, causes you to be able to rejoice and give God praise, both in song and in words when we pray, because you know you're trying to live in harmony with the will of God. The question that I need to ask myself on a regular basis as a servant of God is, Am I resisting God in any area of my life? Am I rebelling, outright rebelling against God in any area of my life? Or am I humbly striving to walk in the master's footsteps? And can I say, it is my food to do the will of him who sent me. It is my sustenance to please him in everything. That is a lifelong process. That is not something that happens necessarily in the babe's life in the babe in Christ's life. It happens in one that is mature, that has humbly put himself, put his body to death, put her old woman and his old man to death, and is now renewed in the image of God according to Christ, who we're created in the image of. That's our goal. That's what we're striving for, to lead a life that brings us joy and thankfulness because we are submitting ourselves to the will of God. Finally, what is God's will? God's will, I'm gladly able to say, is that we all be saved. It is God's will that every human being, 
that has ever lived, that is now living, and that will live in the future, every human being, regardless of color, regardless of creed they were born into, regardless of their ethnicity or nationality, regardless of where they lived on the planet, it is God's will that every human being come to know Yahweh. Come to know Jehovah God. Come to know that he is the creator of all humanity, that he loves us all, that he did, desires so much for us to be with him that he sent his only son into this world so that we can be. It's an offer to us to be saved. It's not a guarantee. It's an offer. Because in John 1, it is said, he who comes to him can know that his sins have been remitted. He who willingly comes and submits to him shall be saved. He who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may, and here's the reason why, to pray for these individuals that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. But why does God care that we live a quiet and peaceable life and have the ability to live in all godly and re godliness and reverence? Look in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, that we live in peace, that we live in times of security, that we live in the ability to live godly and reverence is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Why? He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator above God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Put all that together and what does it say? It is God's will that every people, every nation, every place on the planet have peace and be able to have an environment where people from babehood up could be raised like Timothy was to know God by his grandmother and his mother. He was taught to know God by at an early age. There are people on the planet today who it is impossible to let them even take a moment to think about God and the service of God because they live in utter chaos and turmoil famine and drought and pestilence and war abound in many societies, and we as God's children who are blessed to be in this land should be praying for them, praying for those that are refugees from dictators and, and those who are killers and those who are despots, as we talked about just a few minutes ago. While they are submitting to those authorities as those that seek to serve God, we ought to be praying that God's will be done so they, those seeking and yearning and thirsting after knowledge of God, those groping in darkness, might come to know peace in their lives and be fed and have homes and shelters and here in this land as well because those things literally make it possible for people to turn their minds away from just hand-to-mouth existence and day-to-day -day existence and think about eternity and think about what do I need to do to be a better father and a better mother and a better high school student and a better college student and to be a better servant of the Most High God and not have to worry about whether I'm going to starve today and not worry about whether my children are going to uh, have water, clean water to drink today and not be worried about whether I'm going to be killed by an army today hard to serve God if you don't know him already under those circumstances. And so God says, pray for all those that are in authority so that everybody on this planet can, can come to have the knowledge of the truth. He desires all men to be saved and to come to know him and to come to know his son. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, continuing or saying that very much that same idea. Each one of the gospel writers, each, rather, each, each one of the inspired writers says something to the same thought about the idea that God desires all men to be saved and come to know him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not implied. It's clearly stated. God wants everybody to be saved. He wants no human being to perish. 
He wants all instead to repent of their sins, to repent of their false doctrine, to repent of anything that would cause them to lose their souls and to be saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, my concluding thought is, we ourselves need not to resist the will of God. We ourselves instead need to work in harmony with the will of God. Well, how do we do that? If you're here today, if you're listening today, and you've not obeyed the gospel yourselves, first and foremost, primary on your agenda ought to be obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 says, have you obeyed the Lord? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, you're doing well. If you've perhaps already repented of sins in your life, you're doing really well. If you've been striving to live for God for years and you're listening today and you're saying, I've done all those things, what do I yet lack, you might ask? The scripture clearly says, he who is baptized shall be saved. Not that the water does the saving, the blood of Christ does the saving. That is where you come in contact with the death, the sacrifice, the will of God that says, if you are baptized for the remission of your sins, the blood of Christ washes away, remits your sins. Search the scriptures from Matthew through Revelation and virtually every book there's a passage or two that says exactly the same thing. Don't resist the will of God. If you later this week decide you want to obey the scriptures and obey the Lord and obey the gospel and obey the truth, the scripture says very clearly, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Then call us, write us, email us. We'll meet you here. We'll make it possible for you to fulfill, to finish your obedience to God. All those things that you've done very well already are fantastic. The last thing that you need to do is be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Then be faithful unto death. And God says you shall receive a crown of life that does not fade away. Be strong for those that are Christian. Be courageous for those that are already members of the body of Christ. Do not fear. Do not be anxious. Do not worry. We live in troublesome times, it is true, but we are children of the Most High God. Look to the hills from whence cometh your help. Put your trust in the one who made this world. Put your trust in the one that says, blessed in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Trust in God. Don't resist his will. And then teach others, as was said in the prayer, teach others that you come in contact with now in these troublesome times so that they can hear the good news and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's any need that you have, please contact us and let us know at any time. The elders stand ready to serve. The members of the body of Christ here at Gabriel Oak stand ready to serve in, in any way that we possibly can. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's an invitation for you to obey the gospel or to repent of sins or to give your life back to God or to give your life to God, whatever your need may be.